Welcome to Polycast, a civilization podcast focused on game strategy. Dan Q. Makalua. The Mian Team. Ed Jin. With guest co hosts, No Master. Fazic. I was making sure if anybody was listening to me. <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is your host, Mad Jin, and welcome to yet another... Aw, uh, crap. <laughs> I think I just totally forgot what I was doing there. Uh, no, this is not my YouTube channel. What am I doing? Um, this is Polycast, <laughs> Hello, <isn't> viewers. <laughs> yeah. When you say you stick so often... <laughs> It's like you answer like, the phone at one place for years and you still answer the phone like that. Yeah. <laughs> Just totally messed it up. Okay. Um, Phil, you are wearing pants this time, right? I don't know, I'm never wearing yeah. pants during these. Okay. Let's see if we can start this again. Welcome, everybody. This is Polycast episode 152. Uh, this is Madjin, and I'm joined by uh, co host extraordinaire Phil the Mean Team. Mistakes were made. Makalua. On this podcast, even. <laughs> Dan Quick. So much Civ, so little time. And we're joined by guest co-hosts from uh, Giant Multiplayer Robot, Mel Noma Master Green. Hey, guys. You better take your turn. And Brian Taser? Uh, Spencer? Tazic. <laughs> Brian oh, Tazic Spencer. He's going to tase you. <laughs> he's going to tase me, apparently. Oh, man. And of course, I'll I, bro. And of course, this is me messing up my first cast. <laughs> Your first task as... Yeah, my first task as the new Polycast co-host. That's all right. Majin is the uh, Lisa replacement. Definitely less estrogen. Now, uh, we do have actual topics uh, on this show. No, we don't. (laughs) Oh, why? They pass as topics anyway. Um, I'll pass the time. They're conversation starters so that you and Dan go on and on and on. Uh, that was almost an invite to start singing a certain song, Mackie, but I will not, uh, in the interest hey, of... Hey, we, we've gone over this. Anything I say is not an invitation to sing, period. Do, 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 do. No, it's a request. Do, 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 no, do, it's not a request do, either. Do, 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 do. looking at here is patch 1.0.1.705. This patch largely handles uh, technical problems that have been introduced with Civilization 5 between the last patch and Gods and Kings. The biggest one, previously when they updated the patch, uh, old save files, the DLC leaders would get messed up. Apart from that, there's a, a large number of crash fixes. The most noticeable one is that some people are experiencing a, a hang of the game on turn zero where it gets stuck. There's also several bug fixes involving the Fall of Rome scenario and a few other things. One of the bigger ones is that the peace-loving belief for religion was completely non-functional, and so that has been corrected. So overall, this patch is uh, it's very handy. It's just a, a bunch of bug fixes and will hopefully help make the game more playable. And now when you load your game, Gingus is not suddenly Isabella. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> yeah, I just want to say that I think it's awesome that they fixed the DLC leaders and save files. That was quite annoying, particularly for people who had a lot of ongoing games. So it's great to see that, you know, 2K and Fraxis really do care, and they're going to take that bit of extra time to fix things for us. And this uh, patch is for Vanilla C5, as well as Guys and King. Uh, some people are experiencing problems. Fraxis has asked that if you are experiencing crashes out of the blue, like Old Bear 38 on CFC, that you go to the CIF 5 root directory, that's the directory where your uh, EXE lives for Civilization 5, and post any recent files that end in the extension MDMP, and it'll help them track down the issue that they are having. One of the things that I did see, and I actually imagine you responded to this, was I'm unable to run Civilization 5 and DirectX 10 and 11. I'm using the latest beta driver for NVIDIA, and as soon as we hear the word beta, we stop listening. Yeah, uh, <laughs> pretty much. I'm, I'm using a beta, beta driver. driver. Why my game no work? <sighs> Maybe because you use beta driver. <laughs> And on CFC, uh, the J says, hope there's more in the Q uh, prayer. And uh, 2K Greg, the CIF community manager, says, of course, winky face. 
There's always more in the queue. I mean, as much as some people might complain once in a while that things come too slow or whatever, it's it's not like 2K or Fraxis gave up on Civ 5. It's been patches every couple months, a lot of it based on user feedback. There will be patches, there will be balance changes, there will be all the other stuff that usually comes with it. So things happen. Actually, one of the things I do want to say on my first show, I'm getting tired of having to explain this. If Info Attic doesn't work, talk to the person who wrote the mod. Stop blaming everybody else. <laughs> so often. My game's crashing, my game's crashing. What mods do you use? Info Addict. Why doesn't it work? And one person actually yelled that 2K and Fraxis broke Info Addict and that it was their fault, not that the mod creator had to go clean it up or anything. No, no. <laughs> Oh, a little annoying. There are things that we can rightfully blame 2K and Firaxis for, but that is not one. Yeah. So, of course, uh, you will get this patch automatically pushed to you when you log next into Steam, if you haven't already. But if you're wondering, am I in fact running the latest version? Well, just load CIF 5 and have a look at the splash screen. It'll tell you in the bottom center. So since apparently there's more uh, in the queue, I'm sure there'll be more to talk about in the future. Unless Greg is completely putting us on. I don't know. The winky face is pretty ambiguous. True enough. Giant multiplayer robot, which Magin uh, mentioned in the introduction, over at MultiplayerRobot.com, and that is the creation of both Mel and Brian. There is a video on their YouTube channel on how to use Giant Multiplayer Robot, and to introduce this topic, I have taken from that video and put into one minute, as discussed by Mel. So, Mel, you're going to be able to hear yourself talk, even though you won't be talking. Excellent. I love listening to myself talk. You could, like, dub over and then have yourself in stereo if you remember exactly what you said. (laughs) No. (laughs) Giant Multiplayer Robot is a service to help automate long-term Civilization V games. We use Steam's open authentication system for all of our users. So when you log in, you'll need to do it using your Steam account information. We do not store your Steam username and password. We do not even retrieve your Steam username and password. Now there's a couple more pieces of information that I need to provide in order to fully use Giant Multiplayer Robot. First is my email address. By entering my email address, this allows me to receive notifications from GMR for things such as when it's my turn or if I've been invited to a new game. Now the second and most critical piece of information is I need to provide an in-game password. This password will be used inside of each Civilization V game I'm a part of. This protects my turn from other players inadvertently or intentionally playing it for me. I'll type in a name for the new game that I want to create and select the civilization I want to play as. So I'm going to put this question to you, Brian, since we just heard from Mel. What made you two start Giant Multiplayer Robot? Mel and I are friends and coworkers, and we were having some conversations at work about how we wanted to play Civ V with our friends. And uh, we investigated the current options for Civilization V multiplayer and found that they just really weren't going to work out so easily. We decided to try to use uh, Hot Seat. So the original concept was that we were just going to write a simple, small program to pass the save file around that, would, that we were just going to use internally. But uh, somewhere along the line, as we, were, as we were discussing this, we decided that we might as well just uh, polish it and make it public so everyone could use it. Do each of you have a designated area of responsibility? Oh, yeah. So initially, uh, I created the website and Mel created the desktop client. The, the website has a lot more code than the client, though, so as that finished up, we've both been on the website now. Oh, okay, it actually leads me to what are the differences in using Giant Multiplayer Robot's desktop application to manage games as compared to the website? Why a desktop application at all? The desktop application automates several of the steps required to actually load your game. Um, you can fully play games through GMR just using the website, but you'd have to manually download the save file, put it in the correct directory for Civ 5 to load it, then load it in Civ 5, play your turn, save it again, and then upload the resulting save file back to the website so it can be passed on to the next player. The desktop client simply automates that. You can look at the list of games that's currently your turn in, just click on one, say play it now, it automatically launches Civ 5 if it's not already running, then you can load your game, play it, 
and it will detect when you've saved something to the hot seats directory. It can automatically close Civ 5 for you, since at that point in a hot seat game, once you've played your turn and it's now prompting for the next player, unless you know that player's password and can log into their turn, there's nothing else you can do. You can't go back to the main menu and Civ. You can't close Civ unless you hit Alt F4 in Windows. I'm not sure what it is in Mac. So the desktop client will automatically close it for you. That's kind of handy. And then it will prompt you to submit that file back to our website. In addition to that, if you have it running in your task tray throughout the day, it'll pop up little toasts to let you know, hey, it's your turn in, in this game. So I just click on it, watch my turn, and away we go. Oh, okay. So you can run in the background, as it were, just like Steam can. Exactly. You brought up the hot seat form of multiplayer that GMR utilizes. And Mel, you wrote on the YouTube channel, if you're interested in a long-term game where you take about one turn a day and get to take as much time as you want for that turn and enjoy deep diplomacy outside of the games, then this is definitely for you. If not, that's cool. Smiley face, unquote. Would you consider expanding GMR's capability to suit a more real-time multiplayer experience, or should those interested uh, stick to Civ 5's built-in internet and land game features? You know... It's definitely a possibility. Uh, recently, I investigated Civilization V's modding capabilities, and uh, there are supposed to be integrated features in, in, for mods to be able to access the Internet, do networking and things like that. The problem is a lot of that functionality was I couldn't find the documentation on to figure out how to like download the save files and stuff. But it is possible that at some point in the future we could make it into an in-game mod with, for a much smoother experience. Well, we know that many Steam executives listen to the show, so they're... Uh... <laughs> yeah, if that's the case, I think what the community really is looking forward to is Pitboss, right, for Civ Five, I mean, that allows kind of the best of both worlds. If everybody's online, you can play it real time. If not, then it's kind of a play-by-email experience. You know, you can come to it when you're ready to take your turn. There's something to be said just for the play-by-email aspect. You know, I have not done too much play-by-email, but I did a little. And although it doesn't seem like that much, when you go in there to your email, download the file, play your turn, upload the file... Okay, want any one iteration of that isn't that much, but when you do it hundreds of times in a given game, yeah, it's spread out, but that's a lot of extra work to play a game that you're not having to do when you have something like Giant <laughs> Multiplayer Robot, which is a hilarious name, by the way. I <laughs> like it. <laughs> the uh, other big advantage to, to using Giant Multiplayer Robot is um, Mel and I have, to an extent, reverse-engineered the Civilization V uh, save files which allows us to do things such as verify that the host has set up everyone's civilizations properly. If not, we can override it. And uh, as well, in the future, this will enable us to have multiplayer mod support very soon. Yeah, you uh, noted in late June that a turn timer was added to Giant Multiplayer Robot for all the games. You've got configurable settings, including duration, days of the week, and an expiration window, all of which slacking from Civ 5 itself. And you mentioned the modding already. There's a number of other efforts that you're working on, already starting to work on, wanting to work on, on your Trello board. Is there anything more you can tell us about those efforts? I think probably the next two big things on our task list right now is allowing you to set up a modded single-player game or like a scenario and then import that into GMR and play it just like any other hot seat game. Brian's been doing a lot of investigation into that, and it's very doable. We actually have a game running right now between Brian and I and one of our other coworkers for the new Into the Smoky Skies scenario in, in Gods and Kings. And we're playing it just like a hot seat game. In addition to that, we've been uh, looking at ways of building sort of a community into GMR. These weren't meant to really be to compete or replace other Civ 5 communities, but rather be more just directly related to GMR stuff. Uh, one of the big things we want to do is have some sort of point ranking system um, where we'll reward players who take their turns in a more timely manner, try to make it so that there's some sort of more value in taking your turn fast so you can get rank and levels and things like that. Yeah, you get points. Everybody wants points. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you mentioned that you had a game going with a modded single player game with another coworker. Do you have like a company team for Civ 5 now? Is that what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. It started with Brian and I, and I think we've converted like another eight guys in the office. Whenever there's a Steam cell, we run around and we say, hey, hey, buy this game, play it with us. So, yeah, we've had probably a dozen games through GMR just with coworkers. It's really fun. Specifically, the out-of-game diplomacy gets very interesting. And, of course, when you say coworkers, you mean like in, not just in real time, but like in real space, like you're in the same physical yeah. location. Yeah, like we actually sit in the same room with a lot of these guys. 
Has there have been any um, bad blood yet over, say, violated non-aggression acts or uh, <laughs> somebody wiped out by, by surprise or anything like that yet? Uh, we try to keep that strictly to the game, but, yeah. I mean, yeah, we, we like each other, even though try. we do things that, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't backstab know, though. has a whole new meaning. <laughs> exactly. Although, Mel, yesterday, didn't uh, our IT guy set up that server with a name just to spite you? That's so true. That. At one point uh, in your introductory video, Mel, you state that Brian is already using giant multiplayer robots, so I can look him up by his Steam profile name. Could you look him up by his Steam profile name if he wasn't using the service yet as you're logged into Steam? Like, does GMR not presently make use of your Steam friends list, or do I just not understand that correctly? There's limitations on the, the Steam API. We don't really have a way to search the global Steam user base, so we can only search users that have already signed up on, on GMR. However, you can do uh, invitations by email, and you can also just make a, for private games, special invitation links that'll let people in, even though your game is private. Okay. Brian, Mel has given you credit for the name, Giant Multiplayer Robot. <laughs> I think we can all infer why you might have called that, but let's just find out once and for all why. Oh, yeah, it's, a, it's a, supposed to be an obvious reference to the late game Giant Death Robot in Civ Five, one of the most awesome mechs that you can have. Yes, one of the most historically accurate units in the game. Yes, go on. Yes, exactly. It is. So, yeah, in I mean, stores uh, next week. <laughs> it's not something you're really supposed to think about too much or imply too much meaning from. It's supposed to be a reference to the giant death robot. I just wanted to make one comment about the community. Uh, it's really been amazing to see uh, since we first sort of went into this public beta with GMR back in March. And we wanted to kind of get the word out. So we ran around to all these different Civ forums like Civ Fanatics and We Play Civ and Polyton and 2K. And, and we just kind of announced it. And for a lot of these forums, this is the first time that either of us had posted there, so we were brand new users, and it was met with some skepticism, but we kind of worked through that and, and uh, tried to communicate really well, and since then, it's just been amazing how fast it's grown. I guess there's was really a need for something like this. We've also gotten a lot of support, both, you know, people have donated to GMR to try to help with our costs, so we've gotten a lot of love and a lot of support from the community, and I think that's been probably the most rewarding thing in this whole experience. Understand that if you support Giant Multiplayer Robot with $15 or more, either in one payment or over time, your account will be upgraded to allow you to join or create as many games as you want. I think we've pretty much broken even. You know, we've just paid out of pocket to get this thing going and, to, and get the technology we need. And it's interesting you bring that up. Maybe we could talk about this for just a second. We've been uh, considering changing that. You know, so we set a limit of 10 games per person, mostly because we didn't want anybody to just go nuts and just flood our database with games. Because, you know, it might not seem like a lot, but one GMR game, that includes, you know, just the game. And then if people are actually playing it, that can be hundreds of turns, not to mention all the save files that we're storing. Because we store back two complete rounds per game. And those are, on average, like 600 kilobytes of files. So I think right now we've got, what, almost? I think like a gig and a half or so of save files. Which isn't a lot, but it can grow pretty fast, uh, specific, especially with the, the communities getting pretty big now. So that, that's kind of what that was for. And there's been a lot of people that have wanted to support. And there's been uh, quite a few people that have actually donated a lot more than the $15 sort of suggested you know, amount that we put out there. And that's been really neat. It kind of says to us that they really get value from this. But uh, we're considering lowering that amount since uh, at this point we're, we've got some things more under control and we've got more flexibility with our, with our web server and our databases. But we still want to give people, you know, a, a reward for supporting it and donating because it is really nice and it does help us. I think between the two of us, we probably put, oh, I don't know, like two to three hundred hours into this system, you know, just our personal time. We started talking about, on episode 150, our first impressions of Gods and Kings, and myself and our guest at the time went through a number of our first thoughts from religion in the espionage system and city-states, as well as just diplomacy in the AI, and we're going to continue with that today. But our continued first impressions of Gods and Kings were still not quite at one month since released. So certainly when you talk about first impressions, what's the time limit on first impressions? Well, it's whatever I tell you it is. But <laughs> <laughs> Just for those of you out there listening who have yet to check out Gods and Kings, i got to say, do it. It's amazing. 
all the changes that it brings is just, it really enhances and augments just the whole experience. It's like a completely new game. I think one of the first things that I really noticed when I, I played several Gods of Kings games after it came out, just single player, and we've got some multiplayer ones going on through GMR, how they changed the technology tree. They split up the classical era, it's now two different eras, and the post-industrial era, which I think used to just be the modern era, is now expanded into modern atomic and information. It really offers more paths for you to kind of pursue, which can really change the play style and the way that you approach uh, victory conditions. Specifically, when you're reaching end game, instead of just, I think it was kind of effectively three paths. Um, you want to go diplomacy, culture, or, you know, science, um, or you've got kind of this military thing, but it's really kind of split it up. And if you want to get a science victory, it seems to me at least now that it's, it's a little, you've got to get a little bit more of the text. It's actually a lot more of the text. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is probably the first time in Civ history. I don't, I, I don't entirely remember, uh, some of the older, tech trees, but this is one of the few times that I can look at the late game tech tree and go, that wasn't slapped together in two seconds. It seems that uh, the late game tech tree got a lot more polished, and it makes a lot more sense. Like, going for a technology victory requires most of the technologies, yeah. and not the same yeah. amount as a diplomacy victory. I also really love the addition of uh, kind of pre-atomic era. You have the, the Great War military stuff now that kind of bridges the gap between riflemen and infantry. And you have the Great War infantry, the Great War bombers, fighters, and Gatling guns. And in my last single-player game, I had a war at that, at that era, and it made, a, it made a huge difference that they have that intermediate unit now. Um, I know from Civ Five discussions that there's a lot of people just going, eh, there's just not enough units, not enough variety of things to do once you start hitting the late game, especially when like mech infantry were like right up front in the modern era at one point, and <laughs> it just made it really silly. And stealth bombers, are, of course, not coming exactly two tax or one rationalism policy from radar <laughs> anymore. <laughs> so you don't yeah. mop the map with stealth bombers anymore. Well, you can. It just takes you much, much longer to get there. Now in Gods and Kings, Tyremes and stuff can move over uh, deep ocean tiles after researching astronomy. I don't know. There's just uh, different things like on an islands map or uh, small continents. It's just it's a uh, it's a lot more dynamic doing uh, naval campaigns and pursuits. You know, especially oh, yeah. with uh, that same thing applying to ironclads because. I, I don't know if there was some <laughs> deep meaning to ironclads I didn't understand before, but I just never really had a use for them until Gods and Kings. Yeah, well, a, a naval unit that's after the frigate uh, for vanilla that couldn't go into the ocean turn, and and required coal, which most people re would require you know, for their factories, yeah. uh, was not a big thing for most players. But yeah, in Gods and Kings, it can now go into the ocean, though it has double movement in coastal side. A far bit more useful. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. And plus 33% versus cities. They're big, they're bad, and they can crush cities. A very, very different unit than they were in vanilla. I really like the uh, late game ranged units, because before it was kind of like you hit the crossbowmen, and then that was it. Like, ranged units were virtually useless for attacking other units after that point. But now with Gatling guns and machine guns, for both city defense and on the offense, I, I found them to be very useful. I would definitely say for uh, more defensive, I mean, once bombers and things like that pop up, then machine guns are a little less safe to be wandering around without uh, some anti-aircraft also being around. Just having something other than crossbows after uh, musketmen pop out is very, very nice. I know Gatling guns are definitely a very strong unit for some time. I like to use them very often. And it's fairly easy to get there as well. Yeah, the whole modified range line. And we talked about this before, but I, I'm going to back up just a little bit to say that having the composite bowman between the archer and the crossbowman was also a most welcome addition. Oh, yeah. Little additions that, that make things flow a little better. Um, of course, some people don't like the fact that the pikeman now upgrades to the lancer. But guy with a stick gets given a horse and told to go hit the same thing he was hitting before. It's the, not unreasonable. It's not unreasonable given that Lancers didn't upgrade, have anything upgrade into them before, and neither did Musketmen, uh, with, uh, Longswords now upgrading into Musketmen. So those two units were considered some of the worst units in the game for the longest time by players, because you had to build them from scratch, <laughs> uh, in the Renaissance. Meanwhile, you have all these swords and everything else running around, or, you know, all these other things going that have high promotions, and so any, Civ that had, you know, Musketmen or Lancer based unique units was totally useless. 
At least perception-wise, anyways. The changes in naval combat with the uh, melee naval units that can attack cities and that embarked land units now have defensive embarkation and can stack with the naval unit for protection, and then along with that, the great admiral unit. But also amongst my favorite is the change in the uh, heal promotion. No longer is it insta-heal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was needed. <laughs> that was abusive. Just a little. Maybe shifting focus a little bit here. Uh, new buildings in the game. Of course, with the introduction of uh, religion. Uh, we now have the shrine, which comes at pottery, along with the granary generating plus one faith. Uh, of course, if you are the Mayans, then you get the pyramid, which gives you plus two faith and plus two science. Although my favorite new building is the Ethiopian unique building, the monument replacement uh, stele. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that properly. Providing plus two culture and plus two faith. But uh, later in the game, I also like the addition of the amphitheater, which gives you uh, plus three culture and an artist slot. Well, it replaces the temple, which became a faith-based one, so it's it's nice. I guess the other buildings are the spy-based buildings, so your constabulary and police station, which, uh, for the most part, if you don't want to be stolen from, you kind of need to build. And if you want that extra spy from the National Intelligence Agency, uh, you want to build, but uh, I don't see the constabulary or the police station being must-build type new buildings, uh, unless you're really focused on getting extra spies. Yeah, I find if, I, if I'm the technology leader, I'm more likely to put a, a spy in my city that has the greatest potential for having text being stolen for counterintelligence as opposed to a constabulary. Unless I move the spy in there, and then a technology is still stolen. And I'm like, okay, fine. The CN Tower. One of my new favorite wonders. It's giving you a free broadcast tower in all of your cities, and plus one population in each city. And oh, plus one happiness in each city. I think my second favorite, though, is the, uh, I'm never going to be able to pronounce this. I'm just going to call it the End Castle. The New Schwatzstein, New Schwatzstein Castle. Oh, that's close enough, right? Uh, plus three gold, plus two culture, and plus one happiness from every castle. Of course, your city must be built within two tiles of a mountain that is inside your territory. Man, I sometimes go out of my way for that. Yep. Although, yeah, I mean, it comes with railroad. I like railroad anyway. But, man, oh, man, when you're expanding, and even when you're not, but for the happiness... And the gold, and I also think about if I build this for the gold, then this will help pay for the additional maintenance costs that I'm now getting for my roads turning into railroads, the happiness for greater expansion, or even to help, okay, I've already expanded, now I'd like to get my happiness back up, and, you know, plus two culture. Oh, let's combine that, especially with my amphitheaters, and move along on the social policy tree even more for more happiness, more expansion. It just fits so well. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, the nooch. I, I, I just call it the nooch at this point. I <laughs> I can pronounce it, and I'm sure my mother-in-law would kill me for not pronouncing it properly, but, <laughs> um, and especially since I lived in Germany for three years. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an awesome one coming, uh, an awesome new wonder coming at, uh, railroads. It's nice. Uh, unfortunately, the AI doesn't seem to go after it just because it doesn't like going to railroads, uh, very much, but, uh, um, it, it is one of the good mid-game wonders now. Some of the wonders are at least powered up based on where they are in the tech tree now. Um, late game wonders aren't necessarily bad. They're, they're more insta powered, like the new Hubble Space Telescope, where you're getting two free great scientists, 25% extra spaceship part production across all cities, and a free spaceship factory that doesn't cost you aluminum. All this and more, just for one engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Which you should buy with faith <laughs> as soon as you get there. <laughs> oh, that's just <laughs> oh irony. With uh, with the faith that just uh, great people of your choice. It's assuming you've adopted the appropriate social policy that allows you to build that great person. Of course, it's, it's now a timing thing for me when I go for a tech victory. You know, finish rocketry, and on the turn I'm going to finish rocketry. The the return right before it, I buy the engineer because you can't use them right away, and I finish Oxford so that I can get satellites. <laughs> and then I'll have my free Oxford giving me satellites for the free map and the Hubble Space Telescope opens, slap down the engineer, and now I've got a bunch of uh, great scientists. Anything else on Wonders? Oh, God, the Petra is so overpowered, it's not funny. Comes at currency, it's new Wonder. Plus one food, plus one hammer, plus one gold on all desert tiles. And unlike the Desert Faith bonus, um, it does not distinguish between, you know, uh, oasis, uh, desert with or without other things. Um, so you can get this bonus mm. on natural wonders, though you don't get it on floodplains. Um, of course, uh, if that what? wasn't good enough, even if that wasn't good enough, you still get a free amphitheater 
And you get uh, six extra culture in the city uh, when you hit archaeology. It's also slightly overpowered because if you, uh, at least for if you're going culture game uh, and you start in the desert, because you can open tradition, get legalism uh, after building a monument, go get the Petra to get the free amphitheater, and then go to drama and poetry and then followed by uh, getting to your opera houses and you'll get a free opera house because you already got a free amphitheater from the Petra. So you can have, like, multiple free culture buildings just for showing up and starting in the desert. Uh, we also uh, see some the addition of some uh, natural wonders as well. I just mentioned those briefly. Uluru or Ayers Rock, plus two food and plus six faith. I hardly ever see that one. There's a Sri Pada, plus two food, plus four faith, plus two happiness. Sinai, plus eight faith. And then Mount uh, Clash. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. If not, all hate mail. Don't send it to me. Plus six faith if worked, and plus two happiness if within your borders. Well, I love the, the the last two there because of the faith. I mean, yeah, there's a Luru, and I know it's plus six faith, but I hardly ever see it, so it's really not on my radar. There are also, uh, just to mention, uh, for completeness sake, perhaps, uh, new resources. Um, salt. Love salt. You improve it with a mine. It's a tradable luxury resource. Amazing. Just all you need is, is mining. You can get it so early yeah, if you have it. There's also crab. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Are we going to start having that joke again? Yeah, who's got crabs? I, I, uh, I was very specifically how I was phrasing that. <laughs> I improved by fishing boats. And, of course, truffles. Mmm, truffles. There's also citrus and copper. The major aspect of Gods and Kings that we did not talk about, and we haven't talked about this episode yet, other than to uh, previously say that I don't, Count Spain, because it was previously released and we discussed it before, too, are the new civilization that Gods and Kings introduced, all nine of them. So Mongolia? Is Mongolia counting? No. <laughs> <laughs> the new civilizations, where do we want to start? I think uh, probably you could start with Bodhika, um, just because that really plays on the new religion, as it's kind of a faith-based race. They get a lot of bonuses for that. Mavi eu bidig, bren hines a Celtiaid, heid yed neb am tram brishoi. I like the Celts personally in the, in the older Civ game. I would always play them as kind of my personal heritage. Um, I have ancestors from Scotland. Um, it's kind of interesting. They can start to give faith right off the bat if you're around forest tiles. Um, but you can't develop those forest tiles or you lose the bonus. So it kind of seems like a, a good strategy to keep that in place throughout the early game. And then later as you get more buildings and more, you know, maybe some other faith-based bonuses that can boost that, then you can go ahead and start using them. It's kind of nice if you want to really play with the religion. Um, I don't see, I haven't found ways to really utilize that for a victory, but it's kind of neat. Well, I mean, you can definitely tell if the Celts are in the game. You know, turn five, really Pantheon founded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> this happened in a game with Mel and I. He, uh, he was asking me, like, oh, I see you just founded this Pantheon. I was like, uh, no, I did that, like, ten turns ago. <laughs> <laughs> I forget. Oh, you're the Celts. I see now. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> that is the point of their unique ability, basically. Be first. If you're first, you get choice of anything. And there's also, of course, the uh, Pictish Warrior, the Spearman placement. Strength 11, combat bonus outside friendly territory, and earn 50% of enemy combat strength as faith for pills. Then there's also this ability to pillage at no additional movement cost, which, which is nice, but combat bonus outside of friendly territory, and then this 50% enemy combat strength as faith for kills, plus the faith that you're getting from unimproved forests, and that uh, bonus increases to plus two faith in cities with three or more adjacent unimproved forest tiles. Wow. So, yep. Pantheon, oh, yep, first to the Pantheon. Oh, gee, uh, Celts are in the game. I wonder who's going to get a religion first. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and he can double down, uh, not just not just get the faith from uh, kills for the Pictish warriors, but uh, toss on top of the Pantheon bonus to get faith from kills when you're close to your cities. Go get yourself dowed and uh, double down on the faith and just crank your way through a religion by killing people. Very nice. <laughs> Very historical. It's a fun way to do it. I'm also, in one of Mel and I's latest games, I'm, I'm just barely trying out Austria. I haven't gotten that far, but it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Die Erzherzogin zu Österreich heißt Eure Eminenz. Willkommen in... Ach, bringen wir es hinter uns. Um vier wird gespeist. Well, it's not that I have negative things to say about Austria, but I really have just kind of a... just kind of neutral towards them. It's not that they're bad, but when I look at the other civs that are available, I just kind of go, meh. Um, yeah. Austria is overpowered 
Everybody knows it. Okay, yeah, you're being sarcastic right now. No, actually, so, they are rather overpowered. <laughs> I spent, how, how, exactly does, how exactly I spent, does their unique ability work? Well, their, their unique ability is what makes them overpowered. So the diplomatic marriage, um, you have to be allied to the city-state first, um, and then you throw down five 500 gold. Uh, depending on uh, game speed, of course. And you get their city, you get all their buildings in their cities uh, without getting destroyed. Uh, it basically becomes your city, so it doesn't get annexed or anything like that. It just becomes your city, so it doesn't. It can't be liberated as a city-state anymore. And on top of that, you get their military. All of it. Wow. Mm. Low, low For price. 500, 500 gold. gold. <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that's no joke. Yeah, um, yeah, so this is, I mean, you can actually gift all your units to City State so that it can sit there and pay the maintenance cost for you, and it'll upgrade them, and then eventually you spend 500 gold and go, hmm, need my military now, thanks. <laughs> I'll have to try that. Yeah, plus, uh, if there's a City, city State across to, on the other continent that you've met, um, but you can't really get there yourself and you don't feel like, uh, building a bunch of boats, just hand your military over to the City State. Pick them up, buy them, move on. Interesting. Canadian Wolverine in the chat made it very clear. I guess in multiplayer, anybody who plays Austria should get killed pretty quickly by the other players. Otherwise, they will become very painful. Well, unless you don't have any city states. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. At which point, which would be a reasonable choice in multiplayer. But even still, I mean, Austria get has their coffee house unique building, which is pretty good. It's a windmill replacement. Which does not have the hill problem. Uh, windmills can't be built on hills, but the coffee house can. And you get 25% extra great people points. So you can generate more great people with Austria. Plus, they have the Husser, which is not to be sniffed at. It's a pretty solid cavalry replacement. They're solid even if they're not buying up city-states. You know, the thing I dislike about them so far, though, is that their color is so overwhelmingly cherry red. It's just so bright red. <laughs> And you see it all the time. I'm, I'm even considering using the RGMR magic to go in the save file and just change my color to a different one. It's a little bright. <laughs> but it means you can see them. That is true. I found if you get the Austrian AI into a uh, long-term war from the beginning of the game, they really don't use their unique ability much. They just spend so much time trying to fight you that uh, they're pretty much out of it. And if you don't, probably about mid-game or so, they'll just start soaking in uh, city-states from that point forth. So they're great for anti-diplomatic victories. <laughs> I said, you, you want a diplo victory? No. No CS for you. <laughs> but I, I'd rather have the city-state for myself as, as getting the benefit. I, I'm still going to be a little bit of a holdout here. Especially now that you pointed out all this stuff, and it is going to get nerfed. And by the time I, I maybe come around to liking them more, then it'll just be taken away from me, and I don't think my emotional state can handle that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that was the plan, um, isn't it? Oh, wow. Well, yeah. Okay, let's talk about Sweden. Främling, välkommen till Snökungens rike. Jag är Gustav Adolf, medlem av den aktade Vasaetten. Great general receives a uh, movement allowance uh, if they start uh, turn stacks. Uh, in addition, there's a receive a 50% uh, combat bonus when stacked with a great general. I'm just going to call it the uh, Hacka. Uh, Hacka Pilita. I'll just call it Hacka. It's a, uh, a Lancer replacement. Its unique ability is the Nobel Prize to gain 90 influence uh, with a great person gift to a city-state. And when declaring friendship, Sweden and their friend gets a 10% boost to great person generation. Um, I like the second one more than the first, but I'm still not, I'm not feeling the love for it. Well, when you toss in the other unique unit, the Carolinian, that starts with March... <laughs> Um, take a hack attack, uh, toss in some Carolinians, and generate a ton of great generals. Uh, throw in some great admirals if you happen to, and then just start tossing those great generals over to city-states for instant allies. I mean, come on, instant allies? All you have to do is go beat people up? Mm. Oh, you're just not quite that aggressive. That's probably why. It's, it's more about what I see the strengths of the other new civs, kind of on the, on the face of it. Austria and Sweden down farther on the list of my favorites of the new civs. So, okay, let's talk about the other civ that begins with the letter C. That's new. Carthage. Puku hakanane e tatala memlakata na aman. Anuk dido amalkatka hadast wakulula. Their unique ability is the Phoenician heritage. All coastal cities get a free harbor. 
Units may cross mountains after the first great general's earn, taking 50 hit point damage if they end the turn on a mountain. They also have two unique units, the African Forest Elephant and the... Gosh, God, why did I choose this one? Quinn Kareem? I don't know. It's, it's uh, the uh, Trireme replacement. That has a plus three strength more uh, than a Trireme and uh, four movement. And the, the African Forest Elephant can move after attacking. Yeah, uh, Great General 2, no defensive terrain bonuses, minus 33% penalty after attacking. If you have a map that has anything to do with the water uh, in one way or another, I like this. If it's more of a land-based map, uh, more situational. Yeah, they definitely work a lot better with uh, coasts. I, I've, I've played them in a couple games. It's Having those harbors is really nice. You avoid the upkeep from roads. You get instant trade routes. Um, it, it's, it's pretty useful. I haven't experienced their uh, mountain climbing abilities yet, uh, but I, I imagine in uh, certain scenarios I could really give you a bonus. Um, if you're in a mountainous region, you're able to flank your opponent things like that. And it's pretty neat they added that given the history of Carthage, you know, and how they invaded Rome over the Alps. It's pretty cool. Yes, the giant failure that that was. <laughs> 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 Which is reflected in the uh, the unique ability where you're going to lose 50 hit points on your unit if you end your turn there. But yeah, Carthage is uh, pretty solid if they have coastline. Even on a Pangea map, it's fine. As long as you've got a couple coastal cities, you can connect completely different areas together. Without having to drop a you know a really long road or uh, go around a mountain range or whatever. Hans, much discussion about them uh, before the game came out. The moaning of the battering ram, placing the spearmen, <laughs> plus three hundred percent bonus versus cities. Uh, there's also the unique unit, the Horse Archer. It does not require a horse, and on the start with this start. Well, their unique ability is the Scourge of God. Race cities at double speed. Start with animal husbandry technology, plus one production from pasture. Also, borrow city names from other in-game civs. Uh, I just mentioned that for completeness sake. Um, <laughs> man, oh man, uh, in, in the right situation, if you've got a neighbor nearby, or if the Huns are nearby you in that particular situation... Look out. You want to be able to take those battering rams out before they have a chance to move in and do that damage, which is possible. They're overpowered if you let them get in position, but I don't find them that it's overpowered as in you're next to the Huns and you're dead. I don't make that connection right away. Nah. That's extreme. Just build a couple scouts and they can do the, you shall not pass, (laughs) because battering rams can't attack units. (laughs) Just bring your city with uh, scouts and... Whoever is trying to come at you with only battering rams will sit there and have no clue what to do. Horse uh, archers. Can, they can throw a horse archers in, but you throw a horse uh, unit in yourself or throw a couple spears at them. You can even throw some uh, bows at them, get in too close. They're, I mean, they're powerful in the right hands, but if you're not a complete noob, you should be able to defeat it or at least uh, prevent getting slaughtered. So it's good against the AI. Mm-hmm. Yeah, basically. Not at all. <laughs> I've seen the AI use it quite well. You know, I, I, I've no, I mean, like when you use it against them <laughs> with the horse archers. Oh yeah, yeah, the horse archers are the new Keshix, basically. Get range <laughs> logistic horse archers, and they're brutal. Um, of course, horse archers don't start with shoot move ability, so you do have to get to logistics before you can do that. So horse archers again, they can be stopped because as soon as they shoot, they're stopped. They're stuck there, so you can run them down. Ah. Uh, so you can run them down. Yeah. And battering rams have a negative 33% defensive penalty, which basically means they're weak to melee units. Combat strength of 10 becomes 7, which is a little less than a warrior and a little bit more than a scout. Uh, but they are strong, and yeah. that's the thing. The Huns need to be used early for war aggression to make space so that you can grow, because everything about them is tailored to the uh, early game. The Netherlands. Ik ben Willem van Oranje, stadhouder over the Nederlanden. Behoeft gij iets? Mij staat nog veel te doen. Dutch East India Company retained 50% of the happiness benefits from a luxury resource if your last copy of it is traded away. So long as you have someone to trade with, nice. And I also like the unique terrain improvement. It's also map dependent and where you settle and everything. Love the polder. There are no tulips. 
They do not produce tulips. Uh, <laughs> Come on, there's tulips in the game. Come on. We spent like six months making sure people thought there was tulips in the game. <laughs> Polder, man, oh man, build them on marshes and floodplains. They come at, at guilt. So in a, in a later game, oh, I wish my city could grow a little more so I could make use of these other production tiles. Oh, I know. This is already irrigated on the floodplain. Uh, I'll just change it to a or, or decided I put a trading instead of putting a trading post on there. I'll do a polder. Plus, not to mention that at economics, you get extra production and gold from it. So it, it turns a marsh in, or floodplain into, well, okay, floodplains are already pretty good, but it turns a marsh into a very useful tile and colorful. Yes, and colorful. Yes, they're very Ooh. pretty. Yeah. Are they shiny, Dan? They are very shiny. They are mesmerizing. Especially when you get a massive amount of marshes. <laughs> you just hold her everything. You hit economics and all the tulips pop up. Very pretty. But the Dutch do have some other stuff other than uh, the polar. We do have the sea beggar, not the sea dagger, as much as uh, some bad translations managed to get going. Privateer replacement. Um, it starts with supply and a couple extra counter uh, city promotions. Privateer melee ship uh, that can crush cities very quickly from the ocean. Also very good at stealing ships of the line from the English. Maya? Tohol al discolo. Kuyal al tenja akal. The long count after researching theology received a bonus great person at the end of every Maya calendar cycle, 394 years, which is nice, but my favorite part of the Maya is their unique unit, the Atalist. It replaces the Archer, but is available at Agriculture, so you start the game with it. Oh, and it's also notably cheaper than the Archer, <laughs> almost half its cost. That part is very tailored specifically to the early game, but the long count, they have a little bit more legs in terms of their special abilities as compared to say the Hunt. Well, and the Pyramid. Plus two face, plus two science. Mayans, yeah, expand, expand, expand. Build their unique archers early instead of scouts. Push the barbs away so you can make room, drop new cities, slap up pyramids. Go, go, go. <laughs> Byzantium. Oh, monopion thavma. Pion onoma ipimise, o kalos xenos. Imifeldora, i fili du vizandio. Uh, yes, they have a two unique uh, units, both the cataphract and the droman. Uh, and their unique ability, uh, uh, the, uh, I want to say Patriarch, but there's an ATE at the end. Follow say Patriarch of Constantinople. Choose one more belief than normal when you found a religion. I know at first pass, it, it doesn't actually say a lot to say, choose one more belief than normal when you found a religion. And it's true that you want to choose one, I wouldn't necessarily say right, but something that you're going to be able to take advantage of. But it gives you a little bit more flexibility. It's Oh, I chose this founder belief over that founder belief, or that to make that choice. Well, you may not have to make that choice. You may be able to have your cake and eat it, too. The bonus belief gives you a list of all of the ones that have not been taken and the ones that you haven't been chosen from all of the other levels of a free grab. Yeah, it's basically you can choose anything. And it comes as you found your religion. That's the key thing. It comes with the first profit. So you can, you know, double up on your founder beliefs. Uh, you can double up on your uh, early follower beliefs, although that's a little uh, weird to do. You can take extra Pantheon if you really want. Sometimes there are some decent Pantheon bonuses out there. And you can double up on your enhancer beliefs, as in take an enhancer belief as soon as you found your religion, and then get another one later. Byzantines probably have the most flexible unique ability in the game now, depending on if they actually found their religion. Though, again, if you're playing Byzantium and you're not founding a religion, what are you doing? You missed something. Yeah. <laughs> like, I purposely want to mess myself up here. Important to remind our listeners that not every civilization is going to be able to found a religion in a game. So that's why it's important that you actually keep that in mind. <laughs> and uh, lastly, uh, Ethiopia. Fetawi Yohonko Zubai Chinhoi. Nkwanda Namata. You mentioned its unique building before, the stele replacing the monument, plus two culture and plus two faith. Their unique ability, Spirit of Adwa, combat bonus plus 20% when fighting units from a civilization with more cities than Ethiopia. I really like Ethiopia, but it... How do I phrase it? It's also a very good one for uh, faith generation. It's also very good for fighting, but... 
more of an early on kind of situation, of course, because if you're fighting and you're being successful, then there's less and less likelihood that there are going to be uh, civilizations with more cities than you, uh, and then that combat bonus uh, goes away. It's not so much a negative towards that, but it's, it's a timing of that, and it's also uh, situational as well, you know, relative to how many other civs are around you, who those civs are, how far away they are, etc., etc. It's a mixed bag. I think overall it's, it's above average, if we can call any civ average. Sure. <laughs> um, there, there's the way Ethiopia is meant to be played, and then there's the way that Ethiopia is played, and then there's the opposite to that. Pretty sure Ethiopia is supposed to be going tall as a sieve, go out a couple cities, go tall, and use their unique ability to basically defend themselves against bigger aggressive sieves, uh, because you'll have less cities. Then there's the way they're generally played, and what the AI seems to like doing is spamming out cities and basically doubling up uh, your steel and your shrines to kick out a ton of faith. And then there's the way that people seem to be wanting to play them as an OCC sieve, where you always have that combat bonus going no matter what you do. <laughs> so they're slightly flexible, I guess, on that front. Although they're a unique unit. I forget the name of it. Uh, it's basically only useful around your capital. Otherwise, it's just a normal rifle. So it does balance out their unique uh, ability. The Mahal Safari. Yes. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, so it gets a combat bonus the closer it is to the capital, and then that's it. If you choose to go for a mass expansion plan, then uh, your unique unit probably won't be as useful either. But that's fine. Greg Labs, the 2K Civ uh, community manager who live streamed a Let's Play uh, Civilization 5 before Gods and Kings came out uh, with some. Troll, 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 lol. -lo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a lot of people want war. Of course they want war. Why would they want anything else? Let's, uh, let's get going. By the way, yes, if you point out that I am playing like an idiot, I am going to be playing like... You guys try talking constantly while you play. It makes you really dumb. <laughs> I also don't want to sit here uh, thinking about every move I make, or we'll get through seven turns in the two hours. Hey, we met our first guy. Montezuma's here. All right, yeah, he talks a big talk, but... Uh, uh, so people are saying it's a good thing I went towards war, because if he is nearby, war would have happened regardless. There we go, the Inca. He seems a lot more peaceful than, uh, than Monty. If I denounce the Aztecs, I will earn favor. Uh, Quebec was forced to pay tribute. Everyone wants me to denounce, of course. Okay. Of course you guys want me to. All right, look, Monty, I heard about what you did. <gasps> so I'm publicly denouncing him. De Den declare war? I don't have units to declare war. <laughs> Everyone is freaking out. Okay, I at least saw some people saying I should demand tribute, so... Okay. 30 gold, that's a tiny tribute. I, he says I should be well aware of my own inability to back those threats up. I'm inclined to agree with him. Look, I'm not declaring war this turn, but next time he talks to me, we will, all right? And look, Monty entered the classical area. He's even ahead of me in tech. Travelers have uh, told us that your empire's economy is in a pretty sad shape. If you beg a little, I might give you a hand. Actually, I won't. That's kind of an asshole thing to say. I did just say that next time he spoke to me that I'd declare war, right? So I'm I'm not a liar, man. War's been declared! Uh-oh. Don't give in to peer pressure, Greg, someone said. Look, it's already too late. Yes, I only have one city. I'm going to lose. This guy is now hostile as well. What a jerk. They believe I, I am a warmongering menace to the world. I'm also inclined to believe him. Uh, I really feel like everyone is just calling yep. me out for my shit today. I'm sorry, my crap. <laughs> this is not an M-rated game, I'm not allowed to swear. <laughs> I really feel like I'm gonna get what I deserve for listening to the uh, peanut gallery in the chat here. Now the Inca have publicly denounced me. Well, lovely. I think I'm going to, uh, I think I'm gonna lose. But let's keep going. Do you think I should declare war on the Inca for let's denouncing me? I mean, this seems like a good idea, right? Have I found uh, Monty's territory? Oh my god, I don't even know where he is. He's gonna come at me with like tanks and know. stuff. 
He's gonna be nin he's gonna ninja you. Dude. Oh, it's gonna be horrible. Yep. Uh, Montezuma wants peace. That's not very Monty-like. I will answer do? with war as uh, everyone says no. Ex All right, no. of course. Why would I Kill take him. that offer? <laughs> oh, that's the Aztecs right there. Let's get him. Oh, Monty uh -oh. is offering me a lot of gold and incense for peace. A lot of people are saying accept it. Mm -hmm. I kind of like first rubbing it in his face by it. saying no. All right, we're accepting the deal. A lot of people are saying declare war with Inca. Inca. I could totally, like, what, are they right around the corner? Oh, they're right over there. I could just turn my units around and attack Inca. Seeing lots uh, of Monty no's. denounced me. Uh, yeah. I declared war on you. I'm seeing lots of no's, Greg. No. So I think people really want to see Monty die. We're building a war front right on his borders. They want me to drink a beer and think it will be funnier. Do you think I could possibly play any worse? That's an honest question. Peace treaty with Montezuma ended. Well, that means it's wartime, right? Oh, Monty wants a peace treaty. He's not even offering anything. Refuse! You have to wait for the chat to tell him. Yeah, like I'm gonna take a peace treaty when I've got his city down. Take it, take it! Yes, everyone's saying take it. Boom. Annex, puppet, raise. Look, it's enough raises. Look guys, I don't need the resign button because I'm doing awesome with it. What I should have done was built a citadel quickly where his city was when it was temporarily mine. Okay. All we have to do is take Monty's yep. capital before they take both of my cities. And we'll be okay. Ah, oh, he's got another city. This is the worst discovery of the entire game. Oh, lame. And he's across the ocean. Or more like a narrow channel. I don't lose yet. I've got a capital. I've got units. Look, if I get Monty's capital, I won in my mind. And what happens in my mind is all that matters. Call, Call in today. today. In North America, the number is 301-637-7659. That's 301-637-POLY. In Europe, 44121288-7659. That's 44121288-POLY. The only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. For more information on Polycast, our sibling shows Modcast, Revcast, and Turncast, or about Polycast in general, log on to the series' official website at thepolycast.net. You've been listening to Polly Guest episode 152. I had to look. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Imran. Hot Buckaloo, who has not had enough caffeine, and with me as usual is Dan Q. Brothers, sister, can you spare a turn? <laughs> You've had too many. What are you up for birds? <laughs> huh. The meeting. The only truly deterministic outcome is my victory. <laughs> Her newest co host, Madgen. Still let me on? Sweet. Yeah. Well, and Sam will let you back, though. That's the other. Ah, no, 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 no. You said it was the newest co-host. I'm back. You can't kick me out yet. He, he's under contract oh, now. We have a problem here. He's dropping out. I got a contract. contract. No, no, no. You, I said for this episode, yeah, but you can be replaced after my episode. <laughs> I still had a contract. <laughs> yeah. And our guests, Tazik. Uh, whatever you are, be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what you can accomplish when you don't care who gets the credit. Telecommunications, which brings the CN Tower, because you have to have Canadian content for it to be a real game. Love the plotter. Uh, a holder stupid. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> See, now I'm on the show, so I can't sit here and type it into the chat and go, You guys are stop. <laughs> <laughs> Closing time. Maggie. What? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie doesn't want the episode to end. Well, no. <laughs> no, no, actually, actually, I do. 
Oh, no, it's you, guess. you missed the loophole in your contract, man. Yeah, so whatever. Shall I take try up. to do a closing here? No, 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 no. no. I don't know. Get out of the box. <laughs> we will not end the show. We'll do end the show. Record date July 14th, 2012. Let's play Gods and Kings clip copyright Take 2 Interactive. Civilization 4 and 5 sound clips copyright Take 2 Interactive. Copyright Civilized Communication at Civcom.net.